Okay, welcome to Firefighting Today, the weekly roundtable discussion. We meet each Sunday evening at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, or now Daylight Savings Time. But if you haven't figured that out by 8 o'clock tonight, you're probably not even watching this episode because you already missed it. So uh, that's, that's what we do here. So we're going to talk tonight, we're going to talk a little bit about SOPs, uh, what, what we do with them, how we do with them, just all sorts of general discussion uh, revolving around standard operating procedures tonight. Uh, we do typically have some folks on YouTube. So for the folks on YouTube, if you are watching live, uh, we do encourage you to leave a YouTube comment. If you leave a YouTube comment, we can bring you right into the panel. And if you happen to be live uh, tweeting tonight or playing around with uh, Twitter, uh, the hashtag tonight is FFT, Firefighting Today, FFTSOP. So if you are using Twitter, you can use that hashtag and uh, uh, join us tonight. We can follow some of that discussion tonight. So with that. Okay, my name is Peter Lamb. I'm uh, the organizer of PeteLamb.com, and I also do the Firefighter Training Podcast. Uh, I'm kind of the host of tonight's session, and we will run down the panel. I'm coming to you from North Attleboro, Massachusetts tonight. So we'll kind of run down the panel. Uh, Adam, tell folks where you're from. Uh, Adam Ganley, coming from Kellogg, Iowa, on the uh, Kellogg Volunteer Fire Department, uh, Captain head of training, also head of our uh, junior program we've got going on. Excellent. Thanks, Adam. Good to have you here. Charlie. Charlie Hall, uh, Deputy Chief of Operations and Training, TF Green Airport, Providence, Rhode Island. Excellent. Thanks, Charlie. Glad you could be in here. Ethan. Ethan Banseth, Lorraine, Ohio, student of the trade. Thanks, Ethan. Always great to have you here. Frank. Frank, Black, yeah, how are you doing? Well. Uh, I, I got two Franks tonight. Frank Blackley, sorry. Frank Blackley, Wilmington, North Carolina. Thanks, Frank. I appreciate it. Frank Lipsky, coming back for round two. We didn't beat him up enough last time. Say hello, Frank. We'll tell folks who you are and where you're from. How you doing, Peter? I'm Frank Lipsky uh, from, from St. Louis, Missouri, and I run ModernFireInstructor.com. Excellent. Thanks, Frank. John. Let me get the mute there. John Fisher, uh, Battalion Chief of San Diego Fire Rescue uh, here in the uh, southwest. Excellent. Excellent. Good stuff. Kevin. Hi, Pete. Uh, Kevin Burns, Deputy Fire Chief uh, with the Framingham Fire Department just outside of Boston. Good to have you here tonight, Kevin. Mick. Oh, hold on a second. No, you were right the first time because I heard, hold on a second. <laughs> there it goes. Jeez. <laughs> Technical problems tonight. Mick Mayers with FirehouseZen.com, and I'm a battalion chief with Hilton Head Fire and Rescue in Hilton Head, South Carolina. Good to have you here, Mick. Uh, Richard. Richard Okrasinski from uh, Lieutenant at Moosa Fire in uh, Moosa, Connecticut. Excellent, excellent. So we got a pretty wide panel here. We got uh, we got folks from everywhere. We're pretty much across the country. We got some Korea. We got some uh, uh, volunteer and paid on calls. So we got a good mix tonight. I'm going to start with an easy one. Uh, I'll start with the easy one, and and please give me a comment on that. We'll run the panel just real quick before we get into some heavy discussion. Um, is it an SOP or is it an SOG, and does it matter? What do you call it in your department? Excuse me, what do you call it in your department, and uh, what is it, an SOP or an SOG? Richard? We call it an SOG because our theory is it's a volunteer department, so we're more of guideline-based. Wow, you set me up for a good one. I may get back to that. <laughs> Mick, is it an SOP or an SOG? Well, here. No, you're good. Am I, I good? Yeah, Jeez. you're good. It just keeps playing back and forth there. Uh, we use uh, standard operating guidelines, and there is a reason why we use the word guideline, uh, but I'm sure we're going to talk a little bit about that here shortly. Well, what, what is your reason? I mean, Richard threw his reason out, so what do you, what, what's your basis for that? Well, what we say is that it is a guideline, and 
at pretty much in the beginning of every of the uh, each of the guidelines, it states that this is no substitute for using good judgment. And what we do is we ask people to uh, use the guideline, and that's that's the template for actually creating action in our organization. But if you deviate from that guideline, you have to have a reason for doing so, not just because I felt like it today. And when we hear that, we want to know what it is, because we use that as quality improvement. We can turn around and say, what can we do to make our uh, guideline better after that? Okay, fair enough, fair enough. Kevin, what do you do up there? I know you're in the process of working on SOPs, Kevin, but what are you, what are you calling them, SOPs or SOGs? Yeah, we're, we're calling them SOGs, Pete, um, but I got to tell you, I, I, uh, I'm writing most of them uh, with some help, but uh, I, if it was up to me, I'd call them SOPs because uh, they're procedures that I want the guys to follow, really. Um, so we can talk more about that, but currently they are SOGs as in guidelines. Excellent, excellent. Uh, John, what are you calling them? Apparently we're the only people left that are calling them SOPs. Well, no, you're not, because I was going to go last. I'm an SOP guy myself, so uh, uh, and I'm not just jumping on the bandwagon. But uh, yeah, you know, we don't even necessarily call them SOPs. It's it's more of um, you know we've got an operations manual and a and an admin manual, and and uh, that's kind of how it is. Right, right. Frank, what do you do in your world over there? What are you calling them? Well, I guess I'm in the majority here. We we also call them SOGs as well. Uh, for the same reasons. Okay, SOGs. Frank, what goes on down in Wilmington? Uh, SOGs, and then we also have administrative policies that are um, more in line with what the city requires. Okay, so there's some admin stuff. Yeah, they're, they're, you know, we didn't, uh, well, I'll, I'll do a summary on that when we hit the panel, but that's a good point. Thank you. Charlie, what, uh, you've been involved in several organizations. What are you doing now at the, uh, what are you calling them generally in your world, SOPs or SOGs? SOGs, I'm uh, in with the majority there. We uh, uh, have actually a two-tiered system at the airport. We are locked into the airport emergency plan, which is a set of FAA-mandated guidelines, including but not limited to fire and rescue operations. And then the SOGs apply to our own departmental operations and how we do it and why we do it. And uh, I like the idea of have a, having a guideline. A guideline, I think, is just uh, gives you a, a wider parameter on a procedure. Gives the officers, give the officers and decision makers the ability to think outside the box without worrying, worrying about liability. Okay. All right. Well, we, that, good. You mentioned the L word too, so we're going to talk about liability too. Good stuff, uh, Charlie. Adam, uh, SOPs, SOGs, uh, or none of the above. <laughs> uh, <laughs> SOGs, and uh, I went. Top to bottom at our firehouse last night to uh, look for him, and I was unable to locate him. Yeah, well, SOGs. that's uh, that's that's pretty common. So I was an SOP guy. I was standard operating procedure because I do believe it is a procedure. I think we'll talk about in a couple minutes the way you write your procedure if you write them wide enough. I don't disagree that you want to give the officer some latitude. Uh, certainly, that's the point of an SOP. Uh, there was a time, uh, we had a very significant incident here in Massachusetts many, many years ago, and it was about the time of the shift because certainly, as Charlie points out, from a liability standpoint, if you're not following a procedure uh, versus a guideline, there may be some challenges there. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know, I'm, I'm a little bit ambivalent on that. I, I'm not sure where I stand on that, but uh, that's, that's certainly a choice. Now, to uh, Frank Blackley's point was, you know, what kind of documents that uh, support your department's SOPs? In some departments, there are rules and regulations. There are SOPs. There's the collective bargaining agreement. There is, uh, you know, there's a bunch of stuff uh, out there uh, that support your department SOPs. For tonight's discussion, let's just talk about SOPs and, and how, how they're managed, how they're handled. Um, Richard, in your department, who, how does an SOP come into life? How, first of all, about how many do you have? Have you got a four-inch binder full of them? Uh, what, what have you got? And, uh, you know, how do, they, how do they come to be? 
Uh, we have about 40 of them. Um, about five years ago, one of our assistant chiefs went through and wrote them, got a bunch of uh, other departments to give them theirs. We worked them all together. He submitted them, and they became our SOGs. Um, since then, uh, we've added two, and it takes about four months to get them through the whole process, you know, reviews, and then practice out, and then putting them on the board, and then a month before they go active. Excellent, excellent. Oh, port practicing them, oh my God, we're using them as training documents besides. This is a radical panel I gathered here tonight. I can see that, radical. Uh, quick comment from the uh, from the chat room. We're a little bit, little behind. Uh, Robbie, how, thanks for you being here, Robbie. I appreciate it. He's using SOGs. Guidelines allow for independent thinking, and uh, procedures leave little to interpretation. And I don't disagree with that. I, I would just say it really depends on how you write them. So uh, good, good comment from you, Robbie. I appreciate that. Mick, uh, how many? How do they get? How do how do they happen? Uh, roughly, how many do you have? And tell me about your procedure. Well, you got the right guy here because I'm the procedure guy. Uh, <laughs> I. I I do did a lot of I did a lot of the writing and the original com composition of our uh, guidelines manual and back when we had the procedures manual and I could actually go on for days on the subject. So I, but in for brevity, uh, we actually we wrote SOGs for the main things that we had to deal with, you know, the bread and butter operations, and then we encouraged people from the floor to put to use the same template. And then create a document that matches it, you know, and 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 it correlates with the rest of the document as well. Uh, you know, you don't have to repeat, you know, assume command in every single document if you're pointing to something that says, you know, assume command as in uh, IMS01, which is our incident management system template, you know, and you go through that, and it actually takes you along that route. Um, it goes to the whole discussion that I'd probably like to get in someday about um, actually creating like a wiki where you could actually get in and have hierarchical uh, categorization of all the uh, procedures because some people don't need this big basket of things. They can take something and look at it pretty easily. Some people need to have the, the whole document. So uh, we, we use committees, but you know anyone in the organization can put in an SOG. Um, and then we review it, and it goes through a vetting process, and then we go ahead and include it in the manual if that's uh, if it works out okay. And while I got you, uh, Mick, what? Uh, how uh, often? Do, how often do they get reviewed? <laughs> I may have lost. I'm losing Mick. you there. Okay, uh, I may have I may have lost Mick. Uh, let's there go down to Kevin. Go ahead, Kevin. Uh, how many SOPs, SOGs, and uh, what what are you doing with them? Uh, can you hear me, Pete? I can. Yes. Okay. So uh, we have probably about forty, and uh, we started a few years ago, maybe uh, five or six years ago, and probably had twenty, uh, and then we just recently started uh, sort of redoing them. That's where I've been involved in. So um, we've got. Uh, 20 that existed and probably 20 new ones uh, almost anyway that we've uh, put together um, and we do have a committee uh, and uh, we vet them through the committee and then I have a sort of an informal group that I also use some officers uh, that I like and trust uh, to look them over and then uh, we'll also incorporate some of our specialty teams I just wrote one on surface ice rescues for example and I used our uh, our uh, dive master uh, to make sure what I was uh, coming across with was correct and made sense. So um, try to get as many people involved as I can, uh, and that's uh, that's about how it works. Okay, okay. 
Uh, comment from uh, Joe. Thank you, Joe, for being in the audience tonight. I appreciate it. SOP or SOG is dependent on the definition in the document itself if a liability develops, and that's uh, that's that's true. The way you define this document, what is the use of the document, so on and so forth, and it is an, an AHJ authority having jurisdiction issue typically. Uh, we're just trying to get a flavor of what the panel's doing, but I appreciate you uh, diving in there, Joe. Thank you. Uh, John, what, what goes on? Roughly how many uh, fairly large department and what's the procedure for uh, for fixing them? Yeah, you know, I don't know exactly how many um, we have. As I mentioned earlier, we've kind of got the, the admin side and the ops manual, so two different manuals, um, both uh, fairly thick, although both are uh, online now, uh, and that's how that's handled. Um, we do try and keep it a living document. There is some that should uh, should always be updated, um, and it happens in a lot of different ways. Um, either uh, it's passed down to a battalion chief uh, to work on the uh, on the update, um, and then gets uh, passed back up the chain of command from there. Um, and, you know, and typically, obviously, we'll we'll uh, share that with our peers uh, to get some input, um, as Kevin was saying. Um, or sometimes the uh, deputy chiefs will work on it. Um, some one thing they've started doing uh, just in the past year or so is is uh, sending that down to all of the uh, BCs for some vetting before uh, the policies uh, promulgated, so that we we can put our two cents in. And uh, while typically there aren't a lot of changes made, there are a couple um, here and there, a couple of clarifications or whatever that somebody will think of. And, um, help uh, help clarify things for everybody. Excellent, excellent. Thank you, John. Uh, Frank Lipsky. Frank, uh, how many SOPs or SOGs do you have, and uh, what's the process for developing? Well, Pete, uh, like everybody said, you mentioned the four ring binder. We did. We used to have the four ring binder, but uh, we too are starting to put everything online. So we probably have, I would say, in the range of maybe. 40 to 50 right now. I don't have the exact number uh, off the top of my head, but a similar process. We actually, it depends on whether it's a revision of, you know, a previous SOG or SOP or whether we're starting something new. Uh, we went through the process about five years ago of going through everything, so most of the ones we have are all up to date and current with our best practices. But we do occasionally come up with something that may be countywide uh, that's coming to our department because we work with 42 different fire agencies uh, in a county in one county. <laughs> so sometimes that can cause some some headaches. So what we're doing is uh, we'll we'll get those SOGs or the or the concept whatever it is that we're trying to create the SOG about, and then we will do kind of a vetting process. Usually the training division will initiate the SOG and come up with the core document and then we'll pass that around through the staff and then as well uh, on down through the line personnel. One thing I do want to mention that we've really uh, had a lot of success with lately instead of our old system was that the SOG was created and it just was kind of handed out this is what you're going to do and what we've really started to do now is create a training component that comes with it where we talk about the SOG, make sure everybody's on board and comfortable with it, then we go out and do the hands-on training and we leave it as kind of a working document until after the training and we allow everybody then to give their input based on, and, you know, in case we missed anything or something that didn't go as planned when we were writing it and that's got a lot of good feedback from the floor uh, and our line personnel because they feel like they really do and they do uh, get a voice or a say in, in the final SOG. Excellent, excellent. Thank you, uh, Frank. And you know, a couple of comments in the in the chat room here. We'll share them. Uh, you know, once and you just introduced the county uh, aspect of an SOP. So you have your own department policies, but then you have to make sure that you've got some sort of uh, connection to your countywide system. And uh, I know that affects John and so forth. Uh, Frank uh, Blackley, Frank, uh, your thoughts. Um, uh, do you have a ton of SOPs, and kind of what is the process? <coughs> Well, it's kind of interesting. Um, we uh, used to have a bunch, and then we uh, actually, in 2006, we had a, a department assessment by ESCI, and one of the things they gave was this huge long list of uh, SOGs and SOPs that we needed to create. And really, when our new chief came in, I know it's been uh, five years now, but um, he decided that it was too many, and it was very confusing. And 
we basically culled them down, and now we have an SOG committee that reviews each of the SOGs annually, which is part of the, the things that we have to do because we'll be in a, hopefully an accredited department very soon. But um, you know, all of those things kind of play into what we do and all that. So, that, like I said, I think there's probably 25 or 30 um, SOGs, and they are reviewed, and um, they kind of go from the committee up to whoever typically is going to be responsible for that division that it's coming from, and then it goes to the chief for final approval. Excellent, excellent. Um, Charlie, what uh, what are your thoughts? Uh, you can speak either on the previous department or at the airport, whatever works, Charlie. Well, let me let me stick with, uh, with the town of West Walker. I was the chief. Um, I sat on a committee with a uh, battalion chief, a captain, a lieutenant, and two firefighters, and uh, what we did was we took the department SOPs as they were at the time and uh, uh, we reviewed each one thoroughly uh, additions, subtractions, changes, deletions and so forth were made as time went on and I will tell you the whole process beginning to end took 18 months but uh, when when we were finished and I stood with and I'm gonna quant qual quantify the word finished with saying that's never finished but uh, when we were done with that particular uh, 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 revision, we had 46 that we reviewed. Each uh, each individual in the department, all department personnel received the the, uh, the the good old three ring with uh, with the revisions and the and the and the, uh, and the new SOGs in there. Uh, they were trained on each one. And uh, one thing we decided to do to to try to pique everybody's interest uh, those. Uh, Promotional exams included a minimum of five questions from the S department SOGs. Um, I, I don't remember who it was that said it, but I will agree that uh, uh, SOGs, SOPs, whatever you choose to call them, are never ever finished. It's a it's a dynamic uh, it's a dynamic work in progress, and it's it's never done. And any chief that thinks he's done with his SOGs is in for a surprise. Yeah, without question, without question. Thank you, Charlie. Adam, uh, roughly, well, you don't know roughly how many, but uh, what what would be the process? Kind of a committee of the troops, or what do you think the process will be in your department? Um, I asked one of our past chiefs how they uh, actually did the SOGs, and they actually had a, a small committee is how they did it, and they looked at the neighboring departments around their SOGs and kind of adopted some of their SOGs when they did it back uh I say I don't know how many years ago because a few of them are retired now, so it was a while ago. Okay, good, good. And I think we just answered this question. It's crazy there's a uh, time lag, uh, but I think we pretty much answered this question uh, from Robbie. For the panel, how many is too many? Some departments have SOGs, SOPs for every occupancy type. Uh, department SOPs for the softball term. Is there a number? I think what I just heard as we went down the panel was anywhere from from 45 to uh, you know in the 30s, and I think uh, I had about 33 or thereabouts. Uh, and I agree with you, Charlie, in that it is a a constant process, a very very uh, constant process that's led by uh, there's a number of factors that certainly affect that, and and we'll talk about that. Um, current events sometimes will affect what we're doing, so I'm not sure to answer your question, Robbie. I'm not sure there is a number, but you've just heard departments in in fairly big sizes here from from small departments to large and you were somewhere from 30 to 50 so hopefully that'll that'll answer your question um, what is your what is your newest SOP what SOP did you just create the newest one because you didn't have one you didn't have an SOP and something arose what is your most new SOP uh, Richard our uh, social media policy yeah, that's a great one. That's a great one. I'm sure that's probably typical in many organizations. I just got one. I uh, I actually invited someone from out of the country to be a guest on my podcast, and he said I would love to, but here is my policy, and it was a four-page social media policy, uh, which he has to comply with before he's even allowed to do this. So I think uh, social media is certainly a good one. And uh, as we continue to watch social media in the fire service, um, I think it's good for, you know, there's a big thing about recruitment. If more people keep using social media the way they are, 
we'll have plenty of openings to recruit for <laughs> because, because people are doing some crazy things on social media. So and that's, that is why we wrote ours. It was uh, as most procedures are. It was produced out of blood. Yeah, so. yeah, exactly. And you know, if you, I, I often joke, if you look in the rules and regulations, the SOPs or the collective bargaining unit, you could actually, with a pencil, write people's names next to each clause or rule. Or you know, that's because of Fred, and that's because of this guy and that guy. So uh, I, I agree. Mick, what is your newest? And uh, what was it about? What what incident popped up? What is your latest SOP? Well, it appears that I've got a really bad connection here, so it's kind of cutting in and out to forgive me. Um, I think I'm, you know, because again, we revisit our SOPs on a regular basis. So, you know, the last SOG very well could have been like a, a water supply SOG, you know, that just came back up through the ranks again, and we made some amendments to it. Um, our social media stuff actually ends up being in the policy side of things, which. It, to us, is a is a different animal. Policies are the shall do, shall you know they're more mandated. Whereas the SOGs are, that's why we use the word guideline because we're saying and we're giving you the leeway to to deviate from that. Um, you know, we I know we, recently we've been revamping the uh, ventilation uh, uh, procedures or the ventilation guidelines uh, so that we can address some of the changes in the uh, flow path. Uh, stuff. Uh, we've been kind of revamping some of our uh, truck company operations guidelines to try to marry them up with some of those uh, new recommendations. Uh, that's pretty much the and Well, and we've been working on an active shooter one for a while that we keep kind of tweaking and keep molding to see if it'll work out a little bit better for us. Yeah, so I think that's, uh, I think you've got uh, some good ones there. You know, we've got social media, we've got active shooter, um, and, uh, you know, there's a couple of things that are surfacing here. I do have to put this out there because I was a little astounded when I saw it. Um, and that is, uh, Robbie, the reason Robbie asked the question about how many SOPs should you have is Robbie indicates that his department has over 300 SOGs plus an ops manual. So uh, hopefully he's not... Uh, Hopefully it's not where Charlie is, and that 300 SOGs is not on the uh, it's not on the promotional exam because that would be a little bit of a problem. So uh, uh, it, okay, there's another question. Any SOPs on tattoos? So personal grooming again, that may be on the uh, the rules and regulations side, but we'll raise that question. And I think, Johnny, we just kind of touched on it, that there is uh, some SOPs and SOGs uh, on some of the new studies. Hopefully, we'll, uh, we'll get some more of that. So let's, uh, let's move it down the panel. Let me just see if I can do that. Okay, Kevin, uh, what is your newest SOP, SOG? Something popped up that you, you needed to address. Uh, well, the latest one, Pete, I mentioned the surface ice rescue. I, I also uh, wrote one on um, chimney fires uh, utilizing uh, positive pressure ventilation. But um, I'll tell you, the one I want to write, which will be, you know, really the newest one, will be um, solar panels. Um, they're, uh, they're showing up all over uh, our community, both residential and commercial, and either some, even some uh, solar panel farms. So uh, I've got to write one on those. In fact, I thought I'd ask the uh, the panel if anybody's got information on that. Maybe uh, they can contact me offline because I'll be looking for some help with that one. That's the next one, solar panels. Excellent stuff. Excellent. Good good uh, recent stuff. Uh, John, what is your most recent? What uh, What's popped up? I think the most recent one we put out was a uh, interim air management policy. Um, and I say interim because as we've been kind of talking in the sideline there, uh, it hasn't been vetted through our uh, zone and county partners yet, um, so we'll have to work to get everybody on board with that. Uh, but uh, we felt it was important, so, uh, so we went ahead and put out an interim policy to, to guide people's thinking with, uh, with their air management for now. Yeah, and air management is a, is a big deal. I mean, it's, uh, you know, we 
we're we're getting better. I think you know there's a lot of discussion about it. I think we're getting better, but I'm I'm not convinced we're there yet uh, as as yet. Frank, what's the uh, what's the latest and greatest? Frank Lipsky. Sorry. All right. Sorry about that, Pete. I couldn't. It wasn't giving me my unmute button. I thought you just had me locked off there. No, no. no. I, I, I I usually reserve that for Mick, but I I haven't hit that button tonight. So. All right. Uh, actually, it's it's kind of ironic. Just like a lot of the other guys have said, you know, the social media policy is in the works right now. Um, we have kind of two sides to that. Obviously, the social media policy personally and and things you post, and then also a separate part of the policy for our own social media sites that are administered. Obviously the staff administers them, but we have people from the different areas of the department who actually help to uh, get content. So we kind of had to come at that from two different ways. Uh, we also have a active shooter uh, triage type um, countywide, like I mentioned, SOG that's in the works in conjunction with our county police department. Uh, which which does cover the whole county instead of being split into 42 different ones. And um, and the only other one I, I'd like to mention quickly, and this is one we've taken quite a while to get finished, but we're a combination department, or excuse me, a career department, but we have uh, EMS vehicles, ALS ambulances with paramedics that are cross-trained. Uh, they can be on, on either vehicle on any given day. And one of the things that we, we recognized was that instead of having our SOGs for fire tech be set up to where we would have one engine company start doing an attack with two people and then have the ambulance doing something else and then have another engine come in and have two more people, we decided that we were more efficient with the initial manpower if it was a little bit low uh, to go ahead and have that EMS crew have some designated assignments assuming they didn't have uh, patients to take care of right away. Now we have plenty of paramedics on the fire trucks, so it's really just a matter of having the ambulance or having the actual vehicle there at the scene. Any one of our paramedics could jump right in and and take care of something if it arose. So we really had to come up with a policy that would allow us to have the flexibility to use the paramedics off of the ambulance uh, on fire attack if it was needed for depending on the certain situation. So as you can imagine, that that SOG has quite a few variables in it. Um, but that's one we're pretty proud of. That took quite a quite a bit of work to get it uh, to fit our needs. Okay, good stuff. Good stuff, Charlie. Uh, what what was the most recent thing you uh, you updated or something uh, something that changed because of an incident or because of you know conditions? Well, with the uh, reconfiguration and construction of the uh, runways at the airport, uh, for those of you that are not aware, and I'm sure you're not, uh, we're in the process of extending our our main runway approximately uh, 1,600 feet to accommodate uh, heavy, heavier aircraft loads, international flights, and the like. That done, or that when that's done, uh, forecasting ahead, we saw the need to change our staging procedures. We're heavily, re heavily, we rely heavily on mutual aid, uh, particularly for EMS if we have an MCI uh, uh, at the airport due to, due to an incident, and uh, we saw the need, a glaring need, to uh, to re redo and rewrite our entire staging procedures, which we did. We created a new area, created a new procedure, uh, actually gave staging officer assignments to particular individuals as called, uh, as recalled. Any major incident at, at our airport is going to gonna, uh, require a recall of the entire department, and certain individuals know ahead of time if they're not on duty that night what their assignments are going to be prior to coming in. But the staging area, the recreation and... Uh, Physical and both uh, procedurally and physical recreation of our staging area was our latest. Excellent, excellent. And Adam, if you had your wish, if you needed an SOP right now, what would be your next SOP that you would like to uh, you would like to see? Um, here, when we go out to the rural area, um, actually, I heard it on your podcast is instead of waiting until we're getting on scene to call the tankers, uh, get them things coming ahead of time. I'd like to see that in writing. Because uh, we get some people that are actually waiting until they're getting on scene, and then they're calling in the additional water supply when we're out in the rural areas. So something I like to see is, is that SOP or SOG. Excellent, excellent. Talking about uh, yeah, rural water supply and operation uh, certainly is uh, is an important one. 
uh, let's just uh, put a reminder out if uh, if anybody is uh, watching us on YouTube. Uh, if you leave a live YouTube comment, we can bring it right into the show, so we'd appreciate that. And if you are tweeting, it is FFTSOP. We did get a comment from uh, Tim Lasley. I can't bring it up on screen, but uh, Tim was talking about their county fire association. Uh, they're blessed to have a county fire association, which is able to uh, strong chiefs association. So there, apparently there's some sharing of uh, SOPs, which is good, and everything is up online. So I think all of us uh, really, if I wanted a new SOP, I would uh, always reach out to my neighbor, reach out to a neighboring department and see what was already out there. I mean, I think that's the way we ought to do mm -hmm. business, and I think the Internet has certainly helped that uh, to some degree. Uh, I know there are a lot of major departments. If you ask them, they will send their SOPs out. Uh, they, will, uh, they will do that on a pretty regular basis. Now, the difference comes in is, is that SOP for that large department is that applicable to your department? And that, that's where I get nervous is sometimes it does not necessarily transfer directly uh, into your department. Uh, does anybody, well, let's, let's ask a couple of questions. Uh, I, I don't want to go too far afield, but I do want to address the, uh, the audience out there. Uh, so, Mick, we heard you say that you're specifically talking about ventilation as it relates to the NIST and UL. Is anybody else writing a new procedure based on the uh, UL information? And anybody on the panel? So Richard is saying no. Um, We're about to. You're, you're about to. John says yeah. that they're, they're going to do something. Anybody else uh, jumping on that yet? No, not here. Um, I've actually shared the information, and actually my neighbor that's on the fire department started to read a little bit on the uh, new science and new studies behind it, and he's one that doesn't like change, and he says something like this, reading this, he goes, that we do need to change our operations, so. Yeah, and, and you know, that's a t it was interesting that Mick said, you know, we're doing it in the ventilation SOP because, you know, the science is the science. You're back to an operational concern. It's a structural fire, and the incident commander is going to take some options. Uh, how clearly you want to define those options based on what's out there is, uh, you know, that's your, as I think Joe said, the authority having jurisdiction. I mean, that's, uh, that's something that... Uh, needs to be looked at. And the other one is, uh, does anybody have uh, a little bit s side topic, does anybody have a grooming code or a grooming policy that uh, speaks to tattoos? Anybody on the panel, if you uh, just, if you'd like to just raise your hand or something. So Frank, you've got something on that, Frank Lipsky? Go ahead, Frank. We, we actually have, uh, I mean our policy, it's more in the rules and regulations, but uh, the policy that they have, we had several members that actually had tattoos. It just got in initiated about a year ago. It actually just says nothing on your hands, neck, or face as far as tattoos go. Um, you can have, though, if you'd like to have a sleeve, you can do that. Uh, if they're inappropriate tattoos, then um, they'll, they're supposed to be covered. But we don't have any one that has any that they consider inappropriate at this point. So that's the policy. Okay, uh, inappropriate in the eyes of the beholder, right, right. Yeah, <laughs> it's like, it, it, it's it's like the, pornography, uh, I know it when I see it. Yeah, whenever, <laughs> whenever that, you know, I'll be honest with you, I mean, you know, we all deal with all the different things, you know, that come into play when we're doing these policies, um, you know, so that was, that was just the agreement that was reached at that time, so um, we haven't had any, any real issues with it other than that. Excellent, excellent. Okay, so uh, we're... We said that it's a continual process. We said that it's going. Mick made reference, and I'll go back to you, Mick. You made reference to the fact that if an officer, I, I think I heard you, I don't know if you said an officer, but you said if there's a violation of procedure slash guideline, uh, somebody has to answer to that. Can you talk a little bit about that? Is that a written document? Is that a chat with the battalion chief? What, what, uh, a, how do you know it was deviated from if it wasn't a gross operational situation, and, and uh, what do you do about it? Go ahead. 
you're on. Are you asking me because I that uh, I'm having problems with the feed again? Um, yeah, no, I'm asking if you. We to... have, if we have somebody. Yeah. You there? Yes. Okay, it, it's it's cutting in and out. Um, when we have a when we have somebody that deviates from the norm, you know, we'll identify that. You know, our goal would be that you would self-identify it. That you would say, "Hey, look, you know, I came up on a situation. I had to deviate from what is the procedure, and we discuss it." Um, a lot of times, it it can be handled easily enough by just us saying. Well, why did you deviate? Well, you know, it might have been a life safety issue, and you had to take a, a uh, it, make a decision other than what is considered to be, you know, the norm in in, in the procedure, or I should say, in the guideline. It might be that you know you had a different approach, and then if it's something like that, a lot of times we'll we will identify it in the hot wash, but there are also times when we see it in the after action reporting, and we you know any any decent sized incident will require an after action report. On. Um, we'll talk about it, and then if we have to make uh, changes to the guideline, then we go ahead and make it at that point, and then kind of run it back through committee, and then back through you know the command staff to discuss it. But the the big thing is is that you can't go off reservation without having a reason, and that's you know people kind of look at the guidelines and they feel like. Well, maybe that's a little too, you know, uh, huggy feely, you know, uh, too ambivalent. But the but our logic is is that there are going to be times when you're going to have to go off of the guideline and you're going to have to make good decisions. And we don't want robots as officers. We want people that are using critical thinking skills. They're looking at the situation. They identify that there's something that doesn't meet the the needs that we have right there. And then they use that critical thinking to come up with solutions because our our kind of overarching guideline is that whatever it takes to make our customer happy, you know that's what we're going to do. And again, if it if it requires, you know, we tell you you have to spend you know no no more than thirty minutes on a scene, you know, checking the fire alarm activation. But you know, if we get to that scene and we find out that. Um, Somebody needs assistance in an apartment, you know, upstairs, and and we need to go up there and maybe help them get something together. Then, you know, it's really just a matter of checking in with the battalion chief, letting them know what's going on, and then doing it. And then when we talk about it later, it's like, is it something that we need to add back into the SOG? In this case, no. Um, okay, well, did you do something that's to benefit the customer? Yes, it benefited the customer. Okay, well then. Check off on it, you know, good. So that's really how we go with it. You know, there's not like a formalized. Other than if if you go off of the procedure, you do have to bring it to this to a staff officer and kind of point out what what actually occurred. There. Okay. If that makes any sense. Yeah. No, that's uh, that's good stuff. That's good stuff. Anybody else have a procedure? I'm not going to run the panel for that question, but if you do have a procedure about what happens when you deviate from an SOP, uh, if you'd like to dive in there, just uh, somehow indicate it so I can uh, I can uh, get that question out there. Uh, next one, I think, is probably John. Did you have you want to jump yeah, in on that? Only on one, and that's uh, on our uh, RIC policy. If you choose to um, go in and not use RIC, you're supposed to uh, uh, write a uh, explanation of that and send it up the chain of command to the assistant chief operations. Now I think it goes to. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Now, see, this is. Uh, I thought there was actually a delay, but how how important is that? Uh, does anyone have an SOG on the makeup of rapid intervention, fast or RIT? You notice how, don't you love the fire service? We got so many acronyms, we don't know what to call it, so we got to fit everybody's, <laughs> right? We got to fit everybody's here. Rick Fast, a RIT company. So uh, are you using truck companies or engine companies or just the next available unit? Does anyone want to uh, want to speak to that? Um, that's from Johnny David. I'll leave it up there for a minute. If anybody would like to speak to that, is there a policy? John? Uh, yeah, we typically um, use an engine company, uh, although most of the equipment they need is, is on a truck. Uh, our trucks, number of trucks are limited, so uh, we added a fourth engine to, uh, to all of our responses to accommodate for that. Okay. 
Anybody else want to uh, want to dive out there? Pete, if, I'll, uh, uh, um, yeah, I'll, go ahead, Kevin. Go, go, go ahead, Kevin. I'll, I'll jump in, Pete. Yeah, we, we have a RIT policy, uh, uh, and it's actually being revised now a little bit, but we have a pretty good RIT policy, I think. And uh, just to answer Johnny's question there, we just use the, the next available unit, so it could be anything, engine, ladder, uh, although the RIT equipment is on the heavy rescue, which is at every major incident. So, um, And we're all trained, or at least we're supposed to be all trained on uh, RIT procedures, so it, it's just a question of the next available unit. Most, mostly it's an engine because we've got more engines than we do ladders um, who would uh, be the RIT team and uh, they'd uh, take the uh, equipment off the heavy rescue and get in front of the building and start doing their uh, RIT procedures. Excellent, excellent. Charlie, you wanted to dive in there. Our, our rapid intervention guideline, uh, it's going our rapid intervention team is going to be provided by a mutual aid company, most likely the city of Warwick. Uh, and, and that in and of itself takes on its own dynamic because as my people report in, as I said at a major incident, we're going to recall the entire department. Uh, as my people report in, uh, having more aircraft knowledge, I would prefer to use personnel from my department as the rapid intervention team uh, should they be needed. But uh, that's probably one of our more comprehensive policies as written, uh, takes into consideration uh, 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 air, airframes, uh, stability, fire conditions, uh, everything, everything from A to Z, accountability, and and so forth, and uh, and and that's one of the things that that we have trained on, on uh, on quite extensively is the uh, uh, because we're so short staffed, uh, we feel that's a very important. We've trained on that extensively. Yeah, I think that's pretty common as well. I, I know in my case, uh, even with my staffing, that our likelihood is that mutual aid would be the RIP team without question uh, because we couldn't sustain it. Um, you know, obviously you have an IRIC, you have an initial rapid intervention, you comply with two in and two out as best you can, but uh, you certainly, uh, most of it was, was mutual aid. So let's get to one. Uh, Richard, actually, did you want to dive in on that? Yeah, our RIT team is built between uh, three towns and we have about 12 departments that cross-train into RIT. So our actual RIT guidelines are a culmination of 12 departments in one. So this is what all of our RIT looks like. So all of our RIT teams can work together and take pieces and parts. So it was actually one of the hardest RITs, their hardest guidelines that they produced was because of that problem. Yeah, I, I don't disagree. Uh, we did something very similar. We were trying to do multiple outside agencies. So, uh, and that kind of uh, that kind of will also lead me into my next segue here. Let's spend a couple of minutes uh, at times times traveling, but we'll spend a couple of minutes talking about how we actually get this training done and and where we're going. Uh, comment from uh, Peter. Good to have you here in uh, in the. Uh, the peanut gallery, Peter. Our policy is the next station is the designated written unit. It might be a truck rescue or an engine, whatever it is, it's the next mutual aid company. And I think you're probably right on the mark, Peter. There's a fair amount of departments that have to do it that way. Um, let's talk a little bit uh, about the uh, how are we training on our regular SOPs? We talked about these wide ones. You know, rapid intervention obviously is a very specific skill, hands on, etc. How are we getting the training uh, to the folks that that are getting the SOP? What are you doing for the routine SOP, if you will? Um, uh, I, I don't know, water supply, something. I, it's an operational concern that's an SOP. How are you getting that training done? Does anybody want to uh, want to dive in on that? What What are you using? We've got uh, we got about ten minutes left for the for the session, so I want to give everybody a crack at this if uh, if they want to. I know Frank, you had some thoughts on that. You want to talk briefly about what you're doing, Frank Lipsky? Sorry. Yeah, yeah, Pete, um, you got me. Yep. Okay. Yeah, we um, like I kind of mentioned earlier, we've switched a lot of our uh, the way that we deliver a lot of our incumbent training and uh, things that the members have had in the past. We try to do that all online now. Um, so we've created a flip training program within our department. And the SOGs are no different. So when we deploy any type of new skill, even if it's not a new SOG, but we happen to be training on something that we've already uh, written an SOG on. So let's say, for example, uh, water supply, like you talked about. 
whenever we create our content, in our case, we usually try to create video-based content that we can send out to our members, and then we have quizzes that are associated with that, and we always put a copy of the SOG, uh, whether it's a current one or an updated SOG into that whole package. So when they're reviewing the video and looking at the completing the quiz, they're also looking at the SOG. And then one of the things I do, you know, when you've looked at the same SOG or relatively the same one for 10, 15, or 20 years at your department, um, sometimes you kind of skim over it. You might not catch things. So what I like to do is actually highlight the PDF. Uh, things that are new and I kind of have a color code system that I use so I figure worst case scenario if they're not reading the SOG at least they're going to the parts that I've pulled out that are either new or have been updated or been changed uh, to help key in on those and we also highlight certain things that the company officers need to be looking for uh, within those SOGs and, and our crews seem to really enjoy that uh, to be able to kind of get right to the matter and, and know what's changed uh, with those SOGs when they come out. So that's been pretty successful. I just wanted to mention that um, there, Pete. So thank you. All right. Excellent. Excellent. I do want to go back to a, a quick uh, point on a, on a rapid intervention question. Uh, anyone who would like to answer this, uh, feel free. Uh, is rapid intervention used and implemented at every working fire or does the incident commander have some discretion is it the size you know working fire is you know a, a kitchen cabinets go up it's a it's a quote unquote one line fire but still meets the guidelines of a working fire without question and and you know the other reference was are we entering an IDLH atmosphere with air packs you know that's another question uh, as we meet the federal guideline but is uh, is everybody activating a writ activation at the working fire, or is there, you know, does it count magnitude at, at all here? Yeah. Does anybody want to answer that? Uh, Richard, you want to dive in? Yeah, and where I come from in Connecticut, it's uh, anytime there's a report of a structure fire, more than like a fire alarm or food on the stove or something, that is a structure fire that is has a writ team responded, and then the incident commander can back it down if he desires. Where I grew up in upstate New York, it's the exact opposite. It's the first company in, and then they will decide what they need at that point. Right, and I, I would say, Richard, my, my experience as I talk to people around is if it is, you know, receiving calls or the working fire or a, a, a fire within a structure, the RIT team will be assigned and what the IC does with it. Uh, so I, I find that to be uh, fairly common. Uh, John, would you like to uh, give us a, give us your perspective from the from the left coast? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, yeah, our policy and, and the policy of the the metro zone and county chiefs here is that um, as long as it's an IDLH, we do deploy a RIC team. Um, so that's okay. that's pretty pretty cut and dried there. Yeah, so there's not a lot of debate there, and and I don't know, uh, Frank. Are you in uh, Frank Blackley? Are you in OSHA state uh, down there? Are you uh, uh, governed by OSHA? Because we are not. You know, obviously we we rely on standards here in Massachusetts most days. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> most days we do, but uh, um, we are not an OSHA state per se. Uh, Frank, what's your situation down there? Yeah, the North Carolina Department of Labor enforces all OSHA standards, and um, from a RIT perspective, we are, you know, on any type of working structure fire, obviously we're going to have them involved, and the typical RIT, RIT team is going to be on our heavy rescue. Uh, they're the guys that, that train the most forward, and, you know, of course, you can train everybody, but you've got some people that are obviously much better than others. Right. Well, just a question on your manning, Frank. What, how, many, how many folks on the heavy rescue? Um, it's assigned four, but a uh, minimum of three. Okay, so you can run with three. Um, and uh, Kevin, what do you run on your heavy rescue? Uh, three at a minimum, Pete. We can actually, uh, depending on our manning, take up to five, which is rare, but uh, three probably 90% of the time. Okay. And John, do you uh, have a heavy rescue model out there? Do you, do you use the heavy rescue model, or is it just basically engines and trucks? Uh, we do. Um, it's become more and more popular lately. Uh, we, we uh, as the, the city of San Diego, have had a single heavy rescue um, stationed downtown for, oh, probably, uh, gosh, 30 or 40 years now. Um, that's covering almost 400 square miles of the city. Uh, so it's uh, 
pretty high mileage vehicle. Uh, we do have a second one now that's a state funded rescue, but that one's cross staffed in the north uh, city. And, and uh, I think I've mentioned border drops a couple times um, throughout the uh, throughout the program here. So some of our uh, neighboring partners also have heavy rescues, and and uh, they get pulled in um, fairly regularly on the outskirts of town. Uh, that does be come a little bit of a challenge because um, we get into some uh, typing standards, what exactly they're carrying, how many people they have, et cetera, what their capabilities are. Um, for instance, I know of one that does not have any um, confined space equipment on it. So um, if the CAD just happens to pull up a, a heavy rescue and it's that one, we have to have to have our wits about us enough to know to ask for somebody with confined space uh, equipment. Right, right. Um, We're working through some of those issues. Good stuff, good stuff. All right, we're coming close to uh, to our one hour mark. Another great, great discussion, uh, folks. Any uh, any last? So, so I'm a small department. I'm watching this uh, this uh, webcast. What can I do? What advice would you give a listener here in terms of uh, in terms of SOPs? And, and I guess mine, uh, you know, I'll lead it off, and, and folks can comment if they wish as we as we summarize here. You know, I'd say the internet is a very powerful tool now. I would say first and foremost, reach out to your neighbors, uh, involve some of the pros that are already on your department. Uh, Kevin, you mentioned you know you got a dive master on your department. Yeah, he's probably the guy to write the water rescue, ice rescue SOP, right? So reach out to your professionals, reach out to the folks around you, and then if you do go out on the internet, uh, SOP shopping, if you will. You know, look for departments of similar size and com uh, composition. I think that's important. Uh, you know, find any any of the ones you want and, and keep them in a binder, but look for departments that have a similar size and similar operating conditions. I think you'll have the most success. Uh, anybody who would like to uh, to comment, I won't run the panel if you'd hey, like to. Yeah, what, go ahead, Charlie. Uh, I forget who it was. I don't know if it was Mick or if it was Frank that said... Uh, about he had some uh, policies 20, 25 years old. Um, my advice to anybody, if they can't, can't heed it, is uh, don't let your SOPs or SOGs grow old. Uh, they, they have a dynamic about them. They need, to be, they need to be tweaked and changed, I'd say, on a regular basis, just giving the, uh, the, the, the dynamics of our job today, how it changes, how uh, uh, structural components, uh, staffing, uh, the, the, the WMD issues, everything that we're running into in today's fire service. It isn't just about, about uh, jumping on the back of the truck when the bell tips. It, it's, it's so much more than that. So uh, my advice is don't let them grow old. Review them periodically and, and make changes as needed. Excellent, excellent. I think that's uh, I think that's good advice, Charlie. Uh, one more out of the panel, uh, and that is uh, in terms of training. Uh, Peter Peter comes back and says uh, uh, SOG will post it. Few questions, then correct answers, and uh, they they actually uh, have they gamify the the learning of the SOPs, which is great. I mean, I think that's. Uh, I think that's a great, great way to do it. Uh, good, good stuff, uh, Peter. Good stuff in reference to the training. Thank you, and uh, and a couple of other comments. Anybody else like to summarize anything before we uh, before we take off? Yeah, go ahead, Frank. Yeah, Pete. Uh, what you and Charlie both said. I mean, definitely, I I agree with that. One thing or two little things that we've kind of added. I would say when you write your SOG or when you done your research keep the end in mind you know don't always just start with an SOG that somebody else is and try to build it think about what your goal is as a department what are your capabilities going to be realistically uh, while you're doing because sometimes these SOGs we sit down with the committee and they can get way out of hand and we kind of lose focus on what we're actually trying to accomplish with it and then the other thing I would say is uh, when you have these committees and someone has an opinion because it seems like every meeting there's a new opinion and the SOG kind of can sway one way or the other make them argue uh, and stand up for what they believe needs to be in there not just oh I heard this from another department but mm -hmm. actually make them interact with the rest of the group and you'll come out with a much stronger document uh, at the end. 
No, good, good stuff. Uh, good stuff. Absolutely. Uh, so I'd ask the panel to uh, to stay with us uh, as we wrap up. So if the panel can stay with us, I'd appreciate it. And for those uh, folks watching, uh, we appreciate you watching. We hope we've given you a little something to uh, to listen to. We will be back here next Sunday at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. We'll have a different topic, a different subject. For any of the viewers that are watching, if you would like to see something specific, uh, please just send me an email. Uh, not a problem. Send an email, uh, talk to us, and uh, we'll be happy to uh, talk about a variety of subjects, and we'll get the right people that need to be here. So with that, uh, let's, uh, let's pull the plug on this this evening. Thank you all. I appreciate all the members of the panel and, uh, and all the folks that uh, were listening. So uh, we'll see you next week.